It's good to be back. It's very good to be back. You notice I didn't say I'm home. Because there's a different home. This is not our home. I don't care if you were born in this county. This is not your home. You know that, don't you, Ella? More than ever. More than ever. Once you go, you know, they say. <laughs> Once you go, you know where home is. Can you guys hear me okay? No. Or do I need to turn my thing on? They say no. No? It's my age. Hello? Hello. Talk, 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 talk. <coughs> okay. He's pointing the time to me, so I guess that means it started. Uh, for those who are listening on IsraelNet or by DVD, uh, the portion today is Vaishlach, which means, and he sent. He sent some messengers. And the Torah portion would be Genesis 32.4 through 36.43. We read Psalm 140. For our Hof Torah, we read Isaiah 49, the whole chapter, and Isaiah 61, 60, verse 1 through 22. And for the brief portion, we read Mark 4, verses 14 through 23. And if you'll keep your, your Bibles handy, we're going to read a lot more scripture today. I don't have so much to say as much as I, I want to give you some words that will act like a GPS system to you in scripture. Because as you read God's word, you realize more and more that there's certain words that appear over and over, or certain phrases that appear over and over. And once you figure out what those words or phrases mean, then it is like a GPS system. No matter where you are in which book of the Bible, once you see that phrase, you're oriented. You know where you are in the earth or in heaven, if, if such is the case. But the phrase that I want to focus on this week is, who are these? And you'll see that term throughout the scripture. Uh, for those who are trying to write down a title to the message, let's just call this Levon and Shirley. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Surely, did you hear what Maxine read in the psalm? Surely the righteous. So it's not the Shirley you're thinking of. It's Levon and Shirley the righteous will prevail. So, if you want to turn, uh, let's look again. Genesis 33, 5. This was Esau's question. He's seeing all these, these droves of livestock that, that have been sent beforehand as a present, as a gift. And now he meets the, the wives and the children. And it says, He lifted his eyes and saw the women and children and said, Who are these? So he said, the children whom God has graciously given your servant. And then again, you'll see this phrase. It's repeated in Genesis 48, 8. If you want to flip over there. These are the children God has graciously given your servant. Let's see if there's something different. If there's a different interpretation of it. Genesis 48, 8. It says, when Israel saw Joseph's sons, he said, who are these? Joseph said to his father, these are my sons whom God has given me here. So he said, bring them to me, please, that I may bless them. Is it the same thing? It's the blessing upon your children. It was the blessing upon the patriarch's children. So let's read again Isaiah 49, 20. I'll give you a second. Isaiah 49, 20. The children of whom you were bereaved will yet say in your ears, the place is too cramped for me. Make room for me that I may live here. Then you will say in your heart, Who has begotten these for me? Since I have been bereaved of my children, and am barren, an exile, and a wanderer. And who has reared these? Brianna. 
<laughs> reared. You rear children, you raise livestock. <laughs> Behold, I was left alone. From where did these come? Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up my hand to the nations and set up my standard to the peoples, and they will bring your sons in their bosom, and your daughters will be carried on their shoulders. It's still the children who have been reared in the nations. <laughs> Isaiah 60, verse 8. Now that we know who these people are, it's the children of promise, it's the children of blessing. Isaiah 60 verse 8 asks the question, Who are these who fly like a cloud and like doves to their lattices? Surely the coastlands will wait for me, and the ships of Tarshish will come first to bring your sons from afar, their silver and their gold with them. For the name of the Lord your God and for the Holy One of Israel because He has glorified you. Why would He glorify us by bringing the sons and daughters back? Because it glorifies Him to do so. He brings glory to Himself by blessing you and by blessing your children. And that should also, in your mind, for those who are listening, and I'm going to make some statements today that may not, may not make sense because it's built on a foundation uh, called the Creation Gospel where we explain the seven spirits of God in the context of the days of creation, the seven feasts of the Lord, and the seven churches of Revelation. So if you're not familiar with that, that framework, call us or email us and, and we'll get you on the right track. And then some of this stuff will make sense. But when you hear the phrase, who are these who fly like a cloud, what spirit do you think of? Which one of the spirits? Which day were the birds created? The fifth day. That's the spirit of power. Bringing them home. And remember, remain in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. And so that's what part of that work of the Holy Spirit is. It's not just about gathering. When you look at the feast that's associated with it, Yom Teruah, it's very explicit. It says we'll be caught up together with him in the clouds. It'd be like a, a bird type experience. And that's where you get the creation of the birds on the fifth day with the fifth festival. But not only that, it says they're coming from far places and they're bringing silver and gold with them. So these are the children of blessing. But in every generation, isn't there an adversary? Yes. And the generations of the patriarchs, did they not have adversaries? And do we not have adversaries? Yes. Well, let's look at another passage where it says, who were these? Numbers 22.9. Numbers 22, 9. And we know that where there is a menorah, there is the Holy Spirit that works in the lives of the believers. There is also another influence, which Proverbs calls it a wicked lamp. It's, it says it's set on fire of hell in the book of James. So there is an unholy spirit that strives against the Holy Spirit in our lives. And because that unholy spirit knows the blessing upon our children and us, it's going to strive against it and try to snuff out that holy light. It says, Then God came to Balaam and said, Who are these with you? Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, Zippor is a bird, by the way, has sent word to me. Word is an important word because we're going to talk about the word and the Holy Spirit. But this is an evil word. Behold, there is a people who came out of Egypt, and they cover the surface of the land. Now come, curse them for me. Perhaps I may be able to fight against them and drive them out. God said to Balaam, Do not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. Now, it does not matter if we are blessed. In every generation, there's going to be an adversary that's trying to put a curse on us. 
and they don't necessarily listen to the voice of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These struggles that we have is with principalities and powers in high places. It's not with necessarily people named Avimelech. It's not necessarily with Levon. It's not necessarily with Pharaoh. They are simply vessels for these unholy spirits that are trying to snuff out the Holy Spirit. So these, who are these? Now we know who they are. We've identified them. It's the sons and daughters of Abraham. More specifically, it was also a blessing put upon the sons of Joseph. And they were blessed to return to the land of Abraham and Sarah. Now let's not call her Sarah today. Let's just call her Shirley. Can we call her Shirley? Mm -hmm. Can we call Rivka? Rebecca, can we call her Shirley? Is that okay, just for today? Okay, what about Rachel and Leah? Can we call them Shirley too? Sure. Okay. The sons and daughters of Avraham and Shirley, they're blessed to come back to the land. And the symbols that accompany these children back to the land all through Scripture, it's a, it's a lot of different symbols. Sometimes it's referred to as increase, as wealth, reward, silver, gold, goodly trees from Lebanon, flocks, herds, milking camels, donkeys, oxen, the gathering doves. There's no shortage of symbols that seem to accompany these children as they return to the land. And something that we have in common with the patriarchs, each one of them, is that as we are separated from the land in this moment, they also experienced separation from the land. It was a recurring cycle. See, it has to happen in every generation. You either have to experience a separation from the land, or if you're in the land, sometimes you experience that separation even while you were in the land, which Yitzhak, Isaac, that's what he went through. And as far as we're concerned, we say, well, we were not born in that land. Neither was Abraham. He was the first to go not having an immediate family inheritance in the land. He went sight unseen, and it was almost like a secret. He says, I'm going to reveal this as you go. As you're faithful, as you believe me, Abraham, as you go, I'm going to reveal some things to you. There's some secret things in this blessing that I'm giving to you to be the father of a multitude of nations. And Abraham went. And then later on, Abraham got into a little bit of trouble. He went down to Egypt and sojourned there. And despite everything, because of Shirley, Sarah, his wife, he managed to get out of that situation with a lot of increase, with a lot of wealth. In Genesis 12, 15, it says, Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name, a princess. I will bless her. We always hear about the blessing on Abraham. For some reason, this is going to be Ladies' Day. I don't know why. I will bless her, and indeed, I will give you a son by her. Now, as this Shirley thing unfolds a little bit, that'll be a very deep statement for you to go back and read again. I will bless her, and I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Not just one nation, many nations. And here's the wealth that Abraham acquired from Pharaoh. It says, Therefore he treated Abraham well for her sake, and gave him sheep, and oxen, and donkeys, and male and female servants, and female donkeys and camels. So, Aram went up from Egypt to the Negev, he and his wife and all that belonged to him and lot with him. Now, Aram was very rich in livestock, silver and gold. There's our symbols again. So, when this sojourning in Egypt was over, Abraham leaves with the wealth of Egypt. But we know Egypt means tribulations. You have to go through some tribulation in order to build the wealth of the Spirit in your life. And that's symbolic of the return to the land. And this is a key. It's always going to take tribulation in our lives to produce the wealth 
because of the Spirit. And last week's Torah portion, if anything, made that plain. Because Yaakov, he talked about the tribulation and the distress that he went through in laboring for Levine. Nevertheless, he grew great right under Levine's nose. Abraham's greatest wealth, and I know I'm painting broad strokes here today. I'm trying to show you kind of how all this fits together through the generations. Abraham's greatest wealth was added when he was 100 years old. Just as a little clue, how much did Jacob pay for the land that he bought for Sukkot? 100 pieces of money. Now, if you've read my book, you understand that 100 is the symbol of the nations coming in because of Cornelius and so forth. He was the centurion, the leader of a hundred. So we can see that the nations are being hinted at over and over through the lives of the patriarch. And that great reward for Abraham and Shirley's faith was a son named Isaac, Yitzhak. And he was that child of promise and blessing. Now, where else is this promise mentioned? Turn to page, or page, turn to Ephesians 1 9. <laughs> turn to page 2 in my book. <laughs> Ephesians 1 9. And while you're turning, remember the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God is comprised of the Spirit of wisdom, of understanding, of counsel, of power, of knowledge, and of reverence, right? That's what we're dealing with when we speak of the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians, Paul's speaking, and he says, In all wisdom and insight, two of the spirits of God, the first two, he made known to us the mystery of his will. It's kind of a secret. Or it's kind of been kept a secret through the ages. But he's saying now it's this secret thing is being uncovered according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of times. That is the summing up of all things in Messiah, things in the heavens and things on the earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance. In him we are the sons and daughters of Abraham and Shirley, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. The spirit of counsel is the third spirit of God. So he's just named everything on one side of the menorah, hasn't he? It's a work of the Holy Spirit. This mystery is a work of the Holy Spirit that was determined in us ages ago. To the end, that we who were the first to hope in Messiah would be to the praise of His glory. And that's, it goes back to whose glory is it when we return? It's His. In Him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise. It's Abraham's promise who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, again, to the praise of His glory. It's to the glory of God that we return with the blessing as the sons and daughters. And in us, he says, the Holy Spirit is like that foretaste. It's so that we can understand that we are indeed not just a casual part of that promise given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but that's what it was all about. It's not for a very small group of people. It's for a multitude of nations. And we are sealed in that promise through the Holy Spirit. That's how we're sealed up in it. And this is why it is so important in our liturgy that we say the Magena Vot, a shield to our fathers. It doesn't matter if you're not Jewish. Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov and Joseph were your fathers in the faith. The Holy Spirit is a spirit of promise. And it's evident what was at work in Abraham's life. The Holy Spirit. You don't hear that a lot. 
people want to talk about the Holy Spirit as it pertains to the Brit Chodeshah, the New Testament. But you cannot say that the Holy Spirit was not at work in the lives of these patriarchs. Amen. And it was for our sake Amen. to bring glory to God. Yes. One step in that great blueprint of the promise, again, was a son, Isaac, who would inherit that promise. And you know what? This son, just like his father Abraham, sojourned with pagans, except he sojourned in the land of Avimelech, which is more down in the desert regions, in the southern regions of Israel. And like his father before him, Isaac lied to Avimelech about who his wife was. He says, Rivka, she's my sister. Well, it may be partly true. But let's go back to what his father did in his generation. And Abraham sojourned with the inhabitants of Gerar, the people of Avimelech. It says in Genesis 20:14, and if you want to look, you can see the exact words here. Avimelech then took sheep and oxen and male and female servants and gave them to Abraham and restored his wife Sarah to him. Avimelech said, Behold, my land is before you. Settle wherever you please. Okay, then Isaac comes along. It says, so Isaac lived in Gerar, in the same place. When the men of the place asked Isaac about his wife, he said, she's my sister. For he was afraid to say, my wife, thinking the men of the place might kill me on account of Rivka, for she's beautiful. It came about when he had been there a long time that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out through a window and saw, and behold, Yitzchak was caressing, making sport, in some translations, with his wife, Rivka. Then Avimelech called Yitzchak and said, Behold, certainly she is your wife, whatever he saw. <laughs> there was no doubt in his mind who this was. How then did you say she's my sister? And Yitzchak said to him, Because I said I might die on account of her. Surely. <laughs> Avimelech said, what is this you've done to us? One of the people might easily have lain with your wife and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Avimelech charged all the people saying, he who touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Now Yitzhak sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundred, how many? A hundredfold, wow. And the Lord blessed him. You have to get things straight with your wife before you're going to get that hundredfold. And the man became rich and continued to grow richer until he became very wealthy, just like his father before him. For he had possessions of flocks and herds and a great household so that the Philistines envied him. Does this sound like the story of Jacob? Yeah. Now all the wells, and this is a key because you know what the wells represent. Now all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father, the Philistines, stopped up by filling them with earth. Is it a bad thing when the Holy Spirit gets stopped up? <laughs> Not a good thing. Then Avimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are too powerful for us. When the enemy fears the Holy Spirit at work in your life, he will try to stop up your wells and get rid of you. And Isaac departed from there and camped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. Then Isaac dug again the wells of water which had been dug in the days of his father Abraham, for the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham, and he gave them the same names which his father had given them. Now we could do a whole message just on the names of those wells, because they mean things, and it has to do with the Holy Spirit. But who are these sisters to the patriarchs? Why do they keep lying and saying it's their sister? And what are those seven wills of Abraham and Isaac? Well, Paul called it a secret, a mystery, a hidden reward, a gift, a treasure, because the answer is the Holy Spirit. That is the secret, the mystery of His will. And it says in Scripture that hidden things are hidden for the very purpose to be revealed. It says in Proverbs, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it's the glory of kings to search it out. 
Okay, we'll talk more about that later in Shirley. But because of Rivka, Isaac at first was given the whole land. Whatever you want, take it. This woman's beautiful and whatever you need, it's yours. But it was precisely because of that blessing that Isaac was asked to leave. He grew too great. It was because of those seven wells of water, which we know represent the seven spirits of Messiah Yeshua, that Isaac was asked to leave. The men of Gerar wanted to control those blessings. And if they could not control those blessings, they were going to make sure they spoiled them for the child of promise. And you can see that in your life, I guarantee you. And maybe this is the first main point. The powers and principalities that rule this earth by inhabiting people who can see only by the light of the wicked lamp those same people will initially welcome those who live by the covenant because that blessing of the covenant is on their lives. How did Levon greet Yaakov? He ran and gave him a big old kiss and, you know. How did Esau greet Jacob on his return? Ran, gave him a big old kiss. How long did that last? People want to run and give you a big old kiss and welcome you when the blessing of God and the favor of the Holy Spirit is upon your life. It's the favor and the blessing of Adonai that they're after. It's not you they like, trust me. <laughs> the Holy Spirit, it is a beautiful treasure. It's a beautiful thing because it brings light. It brings joy. It bring, brings the blessing. And that work of the Spirit, they will watch and they will see that it produces a hundredfold. And they covet that. They want that. And they say, well, come on in. Why? Because they want to possess that blessing. But the problem is, once they find out that the Holy Spirit cannot be compromised, that it cannot be blended with the wicked lamp, that there is a separation between clean and unclean, holy and unholy, then they will begin to look at you a little different then their attitude towards you will change. Then it will turn from, come be with us, we can benefit from you, to envy of what you acquire. The Holy Spirit can never be compromised to mingle with the power structures, the traditions, and the gods of men. Amen. And in this season, that's what we need to be thinking about. Yes. Who is trying to tempt us to compromise the spirit of Messiah Yeshua in us and blend it with the traditions of men. When the spirit is holy, surely God will cause a separation between what is clean and what is unclean. Like I said, at first, that spirit of God is very attractive. I mean, Rivka was a pretty lady, apparently. Even at her age, Sarah was a beautiful lady, so much so that Pharaoh would desire her as a wife. And I'm thinking, my goodness, they must have looked a lot different at that age. <laughs> but there is something to be gained when they look at us, and that's just it. That's the key. They see something to be gained by the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. They see something beautiful that they want to possess. It makes the flesh feel good. Just like those little foretastes that Jacob's giving to Esau in the forms of the presents, the gifts, the rewards. He said, this is, you know, you can have this reward. Here's a little foretaste, Esau. It's the mere presence of someone filled with the Holy Spirit that's going to allow blessings to flow in those seven wells of water. Even Jacob relied on two sisters for counsel, didn't he? He sees that Laban's looking at him differently now, and it says that he called Rachel and Leah out to the field where he was tending. And he says, what do we do? What do we do? And these two sisters, for once, <laughs> agree on something. And they say, well, you know, Laban's really not running out to kiss you anymore, Jacob. In fact, as far as we're concerned, he sold us. He didn't give us in marriage. He sold us. We have no inheritance. We have nothing left in this land. 
In fact, Levine actually believes that everything you have, everything you've worked to acquire, all the blessings that God has given you, Levine actually thinks it's his. He thinks we're still his after he sold us. There's nothing here for us. You know what? Jacob, the only thing we can do at this point is leave because there's nothing in the land of Laban for you, for your family. Why? Well, that attitude changes because you can clearly see that it's a blessing of Adonai. I mean, no matter what, Jacob was going to prosper. If it was dark, it was going to be dark. If it was streaked, it was going to be streaked. If it was speckled, it was going to be speckled. When it was Jacob's turn to get that color, it would belong to him. That's the way it would work. The health, the wealth, the inheritance of their children depended upon Jacob's return to the land of promise. Why? Because now Levon has realized that the blessing upon Jacob cannot be mixed. The flocks had to be separated. And over time, as the flocks were separated, it's clear that Jacob's is increasing and Levon is decreasing. And rather than ask himself, what's the difference here? Maybe I should get rid of my household gods and worship the God of Jacob. Instead, he becomes envious, just like Cain, of the best offering, of the pure offering, of the pure worship. He wants his household gods, but he wants the stuff, too. And when you realize that, you know what, God's in charge of this person, and His Holy Spirit is working in their lives, and not mine, because of the choices I've made and who I serve, what that says is his God's all-powerful and mine's impotent to do a thing on my behalf. And so they believe that they can actually steal that power from the righteous. So the sisters, they gave their counsel. They said, return to the land of promise. Let's take all these children, all these streaks, speckled, spotted sheep and goats and things that you've acquired, the oxen, the donkeys, the nursing camels. Let's return to the altar of your father, Abraham. Let's redeem the nations from the land of Levon. Let's take them with us. Because that's exactly what he had acquired, just like Abraham and just like Yitzhak. He acquired that wealth of the nations in the land of Levon, not in the promised land, in the land of Levon. He says, let's take it back to where it goes. It goes back to the land of promise. And surely God will meet us there, and He will help us in this distress. But it started with a secret three-day journey, didn't it? They had to put three days' space between themselves and Levon. Where else has there been a three-day journey, an escape of the righteous? Well, Exodus 5.3, when the Israelites are dealing with Pharaoh, Moses and Aharon go to Pharaoh, and said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Otherwise, he will fall upon us with pestilence or with sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you draw the people away from their work? Get back to your labors. I own you. Just like Levon said, I own you. I own everything you have. Pharaoh said, I own you. I own everything you have. Your sons and your daughters, they're mine. When they fell at Sinai into idolatry, what does it say? Numbers 10.33, Thus they set out from the mount of the Lord three days' journey with the ark of the covenant of the Lord journeying in front of them for three days to seek out a resting place. When you're living in the land of idolatry, it'll take you three days' journey to get up out of that place. That spirit, the Holy Spirit, the secret, the reward, the fruit of the increase, the sons, the daughters, the journey, the land, it's all together. This is your GPS system to know where you are right now. Because it wasn't written for back then. It was written, Paul said to us, Surely the influence of the wives of these patriarchs is critical 
to both the physical blessings, the spiritual blessings, and the return to the land of promise. The return is the work of the Holy Spirit. It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit, even in the land of Laban, even in Kentucky. We can have the fruit of the Spirit right here. We can be increased. You can be increased in the land of Egypt. You can become increased in every nation where you are experiencing your trouble and your distress. The wealth of the nations can be added to you because surely the gift of the Holy Spirit is a gift of Adonai. You didn't earn it. You didn't work for it. Now you're going to have to work to keep that oil pressed out to acquire those flocks and herds. See, people aren't going to find us unless we work to call them in. We have to bid them to come in and hear the living word. We have to work for that. We have to labor for that. But the gift of the Holy Spirit is just that. It's a gift that you did not earn. And He will bless you in the land of your distress. We have to go out in the field. We have to go out in the olive groves. We have to go out in the orchards. We have to go tend in the pastures. Rivka and Rachel were both shepherdesses. They knew what hard work was. And we have to labor in the Word in order to remove a lot of the weeds from the seeds, right? We will have to labor, but this is a gift of the Holy Spirit that's given to us, that promise, the blessing. But what is necessary for our growth in the land of Levine is tribulation. And we don't want tribulation. We don't want distress. I think it says there's a kind of a strange statement when you look at the grammar in Hebrew. It says Jacob was afraid and he was distressed, which actually kind of hints that he was distressed because he was afraid. Because you don't want to be afraid, and that makes you even more distressed when you know you're afraid and you shouldn't be. You should be trusting God. You know, if God promised me he would bring me back, and he's the one that told me to go back through the counsel of my wives, then why am I so afraid? That makes me even more, you know, he needed a Zantac or something. I don't know. <laughs> but when that wicked lamp is just oppressing us, but it's that tribulation that's going to bring us through is the silver and the gold. We have to welcome the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. Because when we start letting that wicked lamp work with us, mix with us, befriend us, kiss us on the neck, we're going to put that precious gift of the Holy Spirit in jeopardy. And that's exactly what each of the patriarchs did. Even though, surely God will help you in spite of your inconsistencies, your deceptions, and your problems. Nevertheless, they put the work of the Holy Spirit in jeopardy. In order to make that lamp, that menorah, shine before men, we have to be very open. You can't put it under a basket and people know about it, right? It has to be very open. But when you begin to deceive people about the work of the Holy Spirit, then you're putting the basket over it. In our tribulations, that is the temptation. But sometimes we are troubled precisely because we have put the work of the Holy Spirit in jeopardy by our deceptions. We can be disobedient and bring about. I mean, it's going to come. But sometimes we start that chain of events. When you think about it, Levon, Pharaoh, Avimelech, they really tried to drag away the wives of these patriarchs. Just wanted to drag them back into idolatry. They wanted to possess them. They wanted to mix them and assimilate them. And had we kept reading in the Torah portion, we would have seen that was the issue with Shechem. Because while they're saying to Jacob and his sons out of one side of their mouth, Oh, we'll be part of you. We'll get circumcised and all this. They go back to the town and tell the men of the town, we'll own them and everything they have. We'll intermarry with them. See, same spirits at work. They want the beauty of the Holy Spirit. They want the power of the Holy Spirit. 
They want the blessing of the Holy Spirit. They want the harvest of the Holy Spirit, but they don't want to work to get it. They want the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but they don't want the covenant. And that's the key. Because there's obligations that go with the covenant. And you meet a lot of people who want the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but they don't want the covenant. But it's all based on a covenant. This tribulation with the inhabitants of Gerar is prophetic. Because Gerar, that root Hebrew word, Gar can mean to live. Ephotagar. Remember that from Hebrew class? Where do you live? But it, the root can also mean to drag away like a fishnet. What's happening to these wives? They're about to be dragged away. And it's in the nets of Gerar that Abraham and Yitzhak jeopardized the promise of gathered nations because that blessing was on their wives. That promise is through the Holy Spirit. They nearly let them be dragged to total assimilation. But the only way we are going to keep the seven spirits of Yeshua flowing in our lives is by removing the debris of the adversary when it tries to possess the work of the Holy Spirit. And by deceiving Avimelech, Yitzhak put his basket over the work of the Holy Spirit. He deceived, he covered up the true relationship. And that's what Isaac did. He permitted those wells to be stopped up by his adversaries. You have the gift of the Holy Spirit. How hard you're going to work to keep it cleaned out is entirely up to you. It was right to redig them. But he had to go through some tribulation and some struggle for that freedom in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not just a beautiful experience. It's work sometimes. You have to dig out the wells of your father Abraham in every generation. Have you noticed in every generation there's very few children that you can look at them as a parent and say, don't do that, I did it, there's no good in it. No. Well, you did it. I'm going to try it for myself. They may not say it, but they're going to go do it. <laughs> and when they come to you crying, because now they're reaping the fruit of that labor, you say, I told you not to do that. Well, I just needed to see for myself. Well, you did. We don't always learn from the generation before. This is kind of part of human nature. And in Isaac, you see, he had to dig out the trash from Abraham's wells. You know, we have to urge our children, don't let Satan's nets drag you into the world system. Let the Holy Spirit work freely in your life. Don't let it get clogged up with the debris of disobedience and deception. Because if you're going to do something, kids, that you know your parents don't want you to do, you're going to deceive them. You may tell them a half-truth like Isaac did. Well, a half-truth is a whole lie. And if you have to tell a half-truth in order to do what you decide you're going to do, then you've told a whole lie and you have clogged up the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. So, back to the question. How come we have to suffer tribulation that goes with the increase? Well, apparently because the patriarchs did. They each struggled with an adversary, a wicked spirit from the wicked lamp, especially that lying spirit. Why is it so easy to lie? Well, sometimes we say it's just to save somebody's feelings from being hurt. We don't have to tell everything we know, and we don't have to tell everything we know. But this was something critical here. How many of you men, if your wife did not have the ability to refuse or defend herself, if some man came up to your wife and tried to drag her away, would you fight for her? How hard? <laughs> Yeah, I know you would. <laughs> I did. I wasn't asking Alan. I knew. <laughs> I already know the answer. But how hard would you fight for your wife? Well, there's a key. They didn't say she's my wife, and I'm going to fight for her. They said it's my sister. <laughs> sister. 
Well, you have a different relationship to your sister. It's right. I mean, and Abraham even told the, the conversation he and Sarah had years ago, where she said, do this kindness to me. Tell people you're my brother, because you have that relationship with your wife. I mean, there's, there's that kinship there. But in this case, it was a deception. And it put the Holy Spirit of Messiah in jeopardy. It really dimmed the work of the menorah. And it could really have compromised the promise if you think of those women had they had children with these wicked people. But no, there was the promise, the children, the inheritance, the land to look forward to. And fortunately, in spite of our deceptions, in spite of our failings in the land of Levon, Yeshua said, I'm not going to snuff out a smoking flax. You've got the Holy Spirit in your life, and you may let it get clogged up with debris, but He's not going to just snuff it out. He's going to call you back. He's going to confront you with your sin. He's going to confront you with your deception. He's going to confront you with your disobedience and say, dig that thing out. Repent. Come back. And that's a beautiful thing in Yeshua, to know that He's not going to snuff us out when we're just sitting there smoking. <laughs> But we have to be so careful not to put the work of the Holy Spirit into jeopardy of adultery. Adultery means literally to add another. And that's what's going on here. The nations, which were supposed to be brought back as the reward and the glory of Adonai, in a wicked sense, they were trying to mix up things to put the wrong influence in there. And we cannot mix and assimilate into the pagan ways of uncleanness. Remember holy spaces? It'll cause a realm quake. There's certain things you can't do in the land over an extended period of time and it not vomit you out. You can't mix holy with unholy because bad things start happening. It might be leprosy as it talks about in the Torah. Illness, death, some sort of greater tribulation than necessary. We cannot allow that which is holy to remain under the influence of that which is unholy because we're putting that inheritance at risk of idolatry. And that's what was at risk in each of these cases. The longer Jacob remained in the land of Levon, the more likely it was for not just his wives who were born there, but his children to be influenced by the household gods of Levon. Is that unreasonable to say? No, because who took them? Rachel. For some reason, she took them with her. And in his arrogance, which is not wisdom, Jacob said, whoever has these idols, they'll die. And he put her to death, basically. He passed a sentence upon her. So we can't afford to be too arrogant about the influence of the world that might remain in our tents. Sometimes we're just not aware of them, but eventually they'll be exposed. But it's nothing to make sport with, as Isaac did. He says he was making sport with Rivka. We can't play games with the Holy Spirit, folks. It's holy. Holy. You don't play games with that which is holy. You don't put it in jeopardy of being mixed with idolatry when it is holy. And that is what we run the risk of in this land of Levon. I mean, isn't it, or shouldn't it be embarrassing for an unbeliever to look out and see us playing games with the Holy Spirit? Dancing on the edge of obedience. So in what sense were the wives of the sisters, in what sense were the wives of the patriarchs also their sisters? Why can we equate them symbolically with the work of the Holy Spirit? Because I know you guys are wondering about this Shirley thing. Because they are flesh and blood. But Scripture teaches through symbols, through relationships. And how many of you men have a little bit of a hard time identifying with the phrase, the Spirit and the bride say come? You've never been a bride. 
in a physical sense. Well, I hope, don't tell me if you're a cross-dresser, okay? <laughs> I hope none of you dress up like a bride. But for a man, and Alan has told me this, he said, I have a hard time thinking of myself as a bride. I'm a guy, you know? And I can see that would be hard. So Adonai gives men symbols and relationships that can help them to understand their relationship to the Holy Spirit to understand their relationship to Yeshua. Because women, we don't have any problem with being a bride. We've got that. We, we see that relationship. But a man can understand the relationship of a lover and a sister. Right? Okay. You love her like a sister, or you love her like a lover. But either of those relationships you can identify with. And Proverbs is full of understanding. If you want to know what to look for in a wife or what not to look for, Proverbs will teach you. And in fact, Proverbs is very clear that a good wife is a blessing of Adonai. It's sent straight from God. In other words, if you have a godly wife, a wife that urges you to live within the spiritual commandment, then she's a blessing straight from heaven to you. Uh, if you want to do a little more research, Proverbs 18, 22, 12, 4, 5, 18, and 19, 19, 14, 31, 10 through 31. All that's going to tell you what a good thing she is in your life. So when a wife is a blessing of God, she is a gift of the Holy Spirit to you. Not just physically, but she's given to you in order to preserve your family in the land of Levon and to give you counsel when it's time to go. She's wisdom, and she will not let you become comfortable in Egypt. She will not let you become comfortable in the land of Levon because it's just a land of your sojourning. It's not your home. She will point you to Israel, where your inheritance is, with the sons and the daughters. She will remind you not to grow too comfortable with all this wealth you've acquired in the land of your sojourning. And she will help you to understand that you have no inheritance there. Because they think it's theirs. They don't recognize it as the blessing of God. She will remind you what it means for you to be a son of Abraham. She won't let you forget that. And if you have a good wife, I don't know, would you work for 14 years for a good wife? For most of you, I would say the honest answer is no. <laughs> would you work seven years for a good wife? Probably not. Maybe. <laughs> would you work for 20 years? for that blessing to come to maturity? Would you fight an angel all night for your family? What Jacob received was a blessing that was a nature of spirit, Israel, instead of the flesh, Jacob, that carnal flesh. And if you will fight for your wife, if you will seek counsel of your wife, a godly wife, not an ungodly one. <laughs> that, that could cause you a lot more problems. You'll be in the land of Levon a lot longer, trust me. But if you will seek her counsel in your life and let her be that well of the Holy Spirit to you, surely you will see miracles of blessing. Surely you will. Listen to how just... Four of the seven pillars of wisdom of the Holy Spirit are mentioned in Proverbs 1. Remember, wisdom is the first spirit of God. But it will mention four in the passage. And this is just a short passage. It says, Wisdom shouts in the street. She lifts her voice in the square. And that word there for square, rechov, it's one of the wells of Isaac, by the way. At the head of the noisy streets, she cries out. At the entrance of the gates in the city, she utters her sayings. How long, O oh, naive ones, will you love, being simple-minded? And scoffers delight themselves in scoffing, and fools hate knowledge. 
Turn to my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit on you. Don't tell me the patriarchs didn't have the Holy Spirit. I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. Because I called and you refused, I stretched out my hand and no one paid attention and you neglected all my counsel. There's four right there. And did not want my reproof. I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your dread comes. When your dread comes like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, then distress, sarah, tribulation, comes upon you. Then they will call on me, but I will not answer. You ever come home and think your wife was there and call her name and she didn't answer? What's that feel like? Where'd she go? Would we miss the Holy Spirit if it was gone? They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me because they hated knowledge. Knowledge is the Holy Spirit. And they did not choose the fear of the Lord. The reverence, the fear of the Lord. That is the Shabbat spirit. That's the seventh spirit of Adonai. They would not accept my counsel. That's the third spirit. They spurned all my reproof. So they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be satiated with their own devices. For the waywardness of the naive will kill them. And the complacency of fools will destroy them. But he who listens to me shall live securely and will be at ease from the dread of evil. That's what your wife is for. She is to be that voice crying out to you speaking to you, being that vessel for the Holy Spirit to pour out on your life, on your sons and your daughters. She represents to you the spiritual commandments of the Torah because that's what it says in the Proverbs. Don't refuse the teaching, the Torah of your mother. She must speak with the voice of the Holy Spirit like those seven wells of fresh water. She has to be that spirit that teacher of the spiritual Torah, and he must protect her from all adversaries. He must never let her assimilate into unclean places. Be clear. Be honest. She's not just your sister. She's your lover. Proverbs 7, 1, it says, My son, keep my words and treasure my commandments within you. Keep my commandments and live, and my teaching as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, say to your wife, you are my sister. And to understanding, you are my intimate friend. That's how you're to relate men to the Holy Spirit, as your sister, but also as your intimate friend. Now do you understand why so many times in the Song of Songs that the lover is referred to as a sister? You can't neglect one relationship over the other because that's a deception. If she's just your sister, another man will take her. She better be your lover and you better fight for her. And what I'm talking about is fighting for the Holy Spirit. She's not just your sister. She's your intimate friend. She is your lover, and you need to hold on to her just that way. When you treat your wife with tenderness, you're actually identifying with your relationship to the Holy Spirit. It's not to be used to deceive other people. You have to be honest about your relationship with the Holy Spirit. You have to value the Holy Spirit. And you have to allow the Holy Spirit to motivate you to work and labor in the spiritual commandments of God. So in conclusion, surely Adonai will deliver on his promises. Amen. It doesn't matter what Levon, Pharaoh, Avimelech, or any other adversary does to us in this land. It doesn't matter. Surely, El Shaddai visits his people at the appointed times. 
Surely this is just the land of our sojourning. It doesn't matter how much stuff you get here. It's a blessing of God. And it will eventually return to the land of promise. And surely your sons and your daughters will return. That's part of their blessing. In fact, surely the wealth of every nation is going to be returned to Israel. That's where it's headed. You can't read the prophets and not understand that. Even if you read about the patriarchs and didn't quite get it, you cannot read the prophets and not understand that the wealth of the nation will return to the land of promise. And surely that return is the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That's why He's given us the Holy Spirit to call out, to cry out with that spirit of wisdom and counsel to the nations and say, it doesn't matter if you're speckled, streaked, spotted, black, white, you're going back if that's where you want to be. Why? Because Jacob purchased for 100 pieces of money Sukkot. It says he built a house for his family, the temple. But for the nations, for the livestock, he built Sukkot. He built those temporary shelters. And every speckled and spotted sheep from the nations is invited. It doesn't matter who you are. He's building you Sukkot. And so the spirit and the bride and the sons and the daughters and the camels and the donkeys and the oxen, they're all saying, come, Yeshua, come. Come, all you speckled nations. Come out of the land of Levon. As I live, declares the Lord, you will surely put on all of them as jewels and bind them on as a bride. Surely the coastlands wait for me. Surely my reward is with God. Surely. Surely. You may have said, who's reared these? Brianna didn't say that. <laughs> Brianna said, who raised these? From where did these come? We can't despair in the land of Levon. It's the Holy Spirit who led us here. It is the Holy Spirit who has kept us here. It is the Holy Spirit who is increasing us here. Yes. And you know what? It's the Holy Spirit that's going to return us to the land of promise. Yes. Who are these? Who are these people? These are the ones on whom the seed was sown on the good soil, and they hear the word and accept it and bear fruit, 30, 60, and 100. Old. And he's saying to them, a lamp is not brought to be put under a basket, is it? Or under a bed, is it not brought to be put on a lamp stand? For nothing is hidden except to be revealed. That's why he hides it, so we can find it. Like y'all do at Passover. You don't hide it so the kids won't find it. You hide it so they will find it. Yes. Nor has anything been secret but that it would come to light. The work of the Holy Spirit is coming to light in this generation, folks like no other. Let the light of the Holy Spirit shine. Don't think that by just keeping your mouth shut, and this is what Mordecai told Esther, he said, don't think you can sit up here in the palace and just keep your mouth shut and all the tribulation will pass you by. That's foolish. God put you in this place for such a time as this. You better start running your mouth or figuring something out. Because everything that was secret, both good and bad, is about to be revealed. And guess what, Esther? You're a Jew. And you'll die right along with us. You know what, folks? If you keep the Torah, if you keep the commandments, and you keep your mouth shut about it, you're going to die with the rest of them. That's right. Amen. Let it shine. If you're going down, go down shining. That's right. We have to conquer the abuse of the Holy Spirit in the lands of our sojourning. We can't be quiet about this, folks. We may have for a while. I mean, you have to go with the speed of the nursing children for a while. But we're not nursing anymore, folks. That's right. There's no titty babies in this room. Amen. And I'm even talking about the kids. Talk to the kids for just a few minutes and you'll figure out. You've talked to pastors that don't know that much. No doubt. 
diaper change. It's time to pick up some speed. As you see tribulation increasing, we have to increase. He is going to add people. He is going to add flocks, herds, silver, gold, goodly trees, all these nations. But we can't be quiet about who we are. We have to be humble. Jacob bowed himself seven times before the face of someone like Esau. If you go charging in there like you're in charge of something, like I own this and God gave it to me, you know what? You're going to have a fight with 400 trained men. No. You come humbly with what you know, and they will be drawn to the Holy Spirit. That tenderness of the Holy Spirit. We can't play games with the Holy Spirit now, folks. It's over. There should be no lying, no deceiving, no gossiping, no playing games with the gift, with the promise that's been put in our lives. There's not time. That's a household idol. Send it back where it came from. When we are confronted with sin in our lives, it's to remind us that this is not our land. We have a promise. We have an inheritance to live up to. And surely our home, our health, our wealth, our increase, our Moedim, they're in the land. And so, what's that say to us? Who are these? Joseph, why are you wearing that multicolored coat? Because the blessing of the nations will be on these boys. Streaked, speckled, doesn't matter. The nations are coming in, whether we participate honestly in it or not. Esau's nature, it hasn't changed. He's going to look at the blessing of God on your life as you keep the commandments and be envious. And instead of turning around and repenting of his error, he'll be just like Cain. He'll try to destroy you to make his offering look a little better. Don't fall for that. Be vigilant and be humble. The Asas, the Levans of the world, they want your children. They want your blessing. They want to stop up your wells. But every day you have to call the Holy Spirit your sister and your intimate friend. And surely Adonai will meet his people. Surely he will save us. Surely he will protect us. Surely He will increase us. And surely every promised blessing of His Word, when it's sown in the fertile soil, when we labor in those spiritual commandments, it's going to bring forth fruit a hundredfold. So, can we do the bread now?